Okay, so hi everyone. Bonjour à tous et à toutes et bienvenue à notre webinar. This is a webinar being offered as part of the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty uh, and part of our Chew on This or Marsa campaign that is um, put, put forward by Dignity for All, which is a coalition of uh, com community organizations, faith communities, civil society across the country calling for justice for people experiencing poverty in Canada. We work at the federal policy level. And this is the eighth year that we have been doing Chew on This. You can imagine that it looks a little different this year as everything does. Uh, so I'm grateful that you're here with us today, joining us on our first e-rally. So thank you for, for joining us. Um, I'll just say a, a few words of introduction. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Natalie Appleyard. I use she, her pronouns. I work for Citizens for Public Justice, and I'm also one of the co-leads of Dignity for All. I'm joining you today from Ottawa on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And we're grateful for their care of the land and waters here. And we are committed as an organization to centering the voices of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and other groups experiencing systemic oppression in Canada. And we are grateful for their leadership uh, for their collaboration and uh, for the wisdom and, and care that they share with us. Um, just as we get started, a few housekeeping pieces about Zoom. We do have the chat, as you can see, some folks have already said hello, that's wonderful. You're welcome to say hello in the chat, let us know where you are calling in from. For our questions for panelists later, I'm going to ask that you use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That will just help us organize things a little bit more. Uh, again, if you missed the announcement earlier, you, are, um, you should have the option to choose English or French audio use on, if you're calling in um, through the internet. So you can select the language. And again, we are happy to have Christopher providing uh, sign interpretation for us as well today. If you are deaf or hard of hearing, when it comes time to ask questions of panelists, if you would like to indicate in the chat that you would like to ask a question, um, we will try to make your screen visible. Um, this webinar format is a little different on Zoom than a meeting, if, if you have experience with that. So if we if we are not able to show your screen, um, please use the chat and we will try to accommodate as best as possible if this if the video is not an option. Um, and if there are any other uh, accommodations or ways that we can help you throughout the, the webinar, you can send a message in the chat. Most of the time my screen will be off and I will be supporting in the background. Um, so again, we want to welcome you all and thank you for being here. I'm going to introduce our moderator for today. So we are grateful to Rachel Chang, who is joining us today as our moderator. Rachel is, uh, works with Food Secure Canada and she's the communications, um, oh, sorry, let me just correct this here. Nothing can go super smooth, right? So she, Rachel Chang is currently the communications manager at Food Secure Canada. She's also a board member of the Montreal Restaurant Workers Relief Fund and Recolt. Good healthy food, respecting both people and the planet and accessible to all, these are the values that underscore Rachel's work, whether in communications, campaigns, or event planning. She has worked with various nonprofits, both at the national and local levels, helping organizations to use communications to build relationships and enact collective change. So welcome, Rachel. We are very grateful to have you with us today. 
Uh, Rachel will be moderating in English and French. And so I'm just going to turn things over to Rachel now and uh, welcome you all and um, thank you again. Thank you, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Great to see people calling in from across the country, which feels like such a treat in these times of um, pandemic and lockdown. Donc aujourd'hui, je vous appelle de Montréal ou Chukchangé, um, le territoire non cédé de Kanangaga, les Mohawks. Um, Chukchangé, c'est aussi un endroit qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre divers peuples autochtones. Donc c'est un plaisir de vous voir tous aujourd'hui. What I'll do, um, I'm happy to uh, be joined by some fantastic panelists today. I'd like to uh, introduce to you Hada Sali calling in today from Scarborough, Toronto. Thank you for waving. Hi, Hada. Je m'ai aussi présenté Dania Marino de ATD Carmonde. Hi, Dania. And on the phone joining us from Northwest Territories is Janine Harvey. Hi there, Janine. So in the first part, hi, great to hear from you. In the first part of this uh, session today, I'll be asking each panelist to speak about the barriers to eradicating poverty in their communities and Canada and what they recommend for overcoming them. I'll start with a general question so we can get a better sense of their work in the day-to-day, -day, then ask them a more specific question related to their area of expertise. Afterwards, I'll ask a few questions to all the panelists and um, encourage them to interact with each one another as well. Hopefully it can be a little bit like a living room conversation as much as possible. So to start, I'd like to introduce all of you to Hada Sali who is community legal worker at the Black Legal Action Center, where she works to ensure that members of the Black community in Ontario have access to legal information about anti-Black racism and can reach out to the center's services if needed. In the past, she has worked in human rights issues such as housing and in refugee protection and comes from a social justice research background. The Black Legal Action Center, BLAC or Black for short, is a community clinic providing free legal services to lower no income Black Ontarians, working to combat individual and systemic anti-Black racism. Um, so glad to hear from you, Hada. Sorry, I just forgot one other little housekeeping thing that I'll mention to all the panelists. I wanted to uh, express uh, my gratitude and the gratitude of all the participants today for you to share your experience and your expertise. And I wanted to um, mention that if I ever ask a question, or if you're ever asked a question elsewhere um, that you don't feel comfortable responding and you prefer to speak some, about something else, uh, you can feel free to pass as well. We recognize that um, sometimes lived experiences you might not wanna share, um, but maybe you wanna talk about something else as well. So you have the power to decline if you like. So how then? Uh, great to see you in Toronto, uh, my hometown actually, and you spent a bit of time in Montreal, so it's great to meet you virtually. Um, I'll start with a short question to help us understand a bit more of your context, and then I'll get into a more detailed question. Uh, how that, what brings you to this work, and how is your work like uh, in Toronto, in a city grappling with the pandemic? Okay, well, first of all, thank you uh, so much for inviting me to be here, for inviting Black. Um, thanks, Natalie and Rachel, for the introductions. Um, so, uh, what it is like working right now, <laughs> I think is a pretty, I think all of us are struggling a lot, of course. Um, uh, Black right now is um, obviously we're working in the midst of a pandemic, but we're also working in the midst of a moment of um, a lot of action, a lot of collective action, uh, working to combat anti-Black racism. So what we see, what we saw in the past summer has definitely impacted our work a lot. Um, we're seeing a lot of folks becoming extremely vocal about anti-Black racism, issues of anti-Black racism, how to combat it, and, um, you know, working together to bring new ideas about how to do that. And um, I think we're really fortunate to be witnessing this. It's, um, you know, um, obviously there's many struggles right now, but I always like to look at the fact that we are able to imagine new things together. Um, and certainly at, um, at Black right now, we're working... Um, we're, you know, we're, we're working with our community to, to navigate what those possibilities look like, how people have been impacted, and certainly how anti-Black um, anti racism has um, led to a more severe impact of the pandemic for the Black community in Ontario. Um, I'm in Toronto, but um, our legal clinic has an Ontario-wide mandate, so we hear from folks all over the province, um, and, you know, that comes in the form of 
you know, issues of unemployment, issues with social assistance. Right now, um, people are going back to school. Um, and, you know, obviously all those things intersect very severely with poverty and with anti-Black racism. So um, that's, that's where we're at, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Hada. Um, so now onto the more detailed question. Uh, so you're a community legal worker with Black, and you and your team represent clients whose rights are being denied because of anti-Black racism and other forms of systemic oppression. And you mentioned that you work across Ontario. Could you um, share some of the examples of the kinds of barriers um, that members of Black communities are facing today and how this intersects with poverty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course, as we understand, I think um, poverty is systemic. Um, it's not, you know, it's certainly not an issue of uh, you should work harder, make more money and you'll be fine. Um, and it's cyclical as well. You know, you enter a cycle or, you know, people who are low income enter a cycle and it becomes harder and harder and um, issues of oppression compound. Um, and it's also poverty is criminalized. And um, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're at a moment right now where people are becoming more vocal on issues of anti-Black racism and recognizing also what Black people have known for a long time, but maybe becoming more apparent um, to other, um, to non-Black people in Canada is the way that Black people are criminalized. And so how do the, that intersection of poverty is criminalized and, and you know, um, Black communities is criminalized, individuals and communities together. Um, and, um, the, the impacts of that are certainly severe. To provide some examples in terms of how poverty impacts Black people, especially in Canada, uh, I can just read out a few statistics. These are from the United Nations Working Group of Experts on, um, on People of African Descent. The, these are from a working group in 2017. Um, so 50% of the Black Canadian population are categorized as low income, with that number jumping to 65% for new Black immigrants. And as we know also, a huge portion of the Black population in Canada are new immigrants. Um, also, Black children are living in poverty with, um, with a poverty, with uh, the rate of uh, children living below the poverty line for people of Caribbean heritage is 33% and for children from continental Africa is at 47%. And this is compared to 18% of the white Canadian, white Canadian children. Um, also, African Canadians compromise comprise 3% uh, of the general uh, Canadian population, but make up 10% of the prison population. And obviously, you know, all these issues intersect. We're talking about prisons. We, we're talking about poverty. We also have to talk about incarceration. We're talking about poverty. We also have to talk about education, employment, and certainly right now, healthcare, um, and how those things intersect. And if anything has shown us how um, how our livelihoods intersect in these ways and how it, how oppressions compound with each other and make it so that certain people have less of a chance to survive. Um, it certainly is this pandemic. Um, so at our, at Black, um, you know, we cert we obviously as a legal aid clinic, we work at that intersection. As a legal aid clinic working directly to combat anti-Black racism, we work at that intersection of poverty and anti-Black racism and how that impacts our community. So we, we see this daily and we recognize also, we have to think from a framework of racialized poverty. Folks wanna learn about more, a bit more about that than we can, um, then I would invite you to look up the um, group Color of Poverty, Color of Change. They have some toolkits or some um, fact sheets that provide um, more information about racialized poverty and how Black people in particular also are impacted um, by poverty more severely. So some examples from clients that we hear, you know, in education, um, for example, um, when we think about Black people and how um, this Canada as a state or um, Canadians in general, or the way that settler colonialism has formulated Blackness on these lands and the way that it's been criminalized, um, this has an, this has also severely led to an impact in the education system and the way that black children from an early age are criminalized leading to over disciplining and black children are um, disproportionately expelled at higher rates um, due to that fact that even from a young age black children are criminalized and viewed that way so not given as many chances and um, you know presumed to be doing bad things um, therefore over disciplined therefore expelled more often and you know when we think also about um, 
and we think about that cycle of poverty, you know, if somebody gets expelled at early age in their lives, what does that mean later on? How, ha how does that severely impact them and force them out of an education system and force them out of that system that could potentially lead them out of poverty or, you know, bring them into poverty also? Um, so those are some examples we hear, you know, we hear from parents um, whose children are being over-disciplined. Uh, we hear from teachers who are seeing, from Black teachers also who are seeing this and who are having difficulty in um, advocating for Black students um, who could also be pushed out from, you know, school boards and uh, mistreated in that, then that's also an issue of employment and, and the, you know, the, the concerns that Black employees bring up in the workplace and how it impacts them. Also thinking about employment, um, you know, we, we hear from a lot of folks who are facing anti-Black racism, either from their uh, colleagues or from their managers and how that impacts livelihoods. I mean, that's pretty clear, obviously, right? If your workplace is not, a, it's not an environment where you're being treated fairly, where you are, um, where you, maybe you're being reprimanded or maybe um, you're being pushed out. Maybe you were the first, you know, you were the first to be fired when the pandemic hit and the lockdown orders came um, and then you were not called back when things started to open up again. And that's also, these are things that we're hearing from, hearing a lot of, you know, we, we help folks bring up um, human rights complaints on these issues a lot. So uh, the, way that, the way that these workplaces are, form, are formed and structured and make it possible for Black people to be abused or neglected or reprimanded in their workplaces and the long, you know, impacts of that you know, how that obviously would impact their children and so on. We also hear from clients who have issues with social assistance. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to also thinking about, okay, how, how Black communities have been criminalized and also how there's a bias toward not believing Black people often. And this comes in the form of um, folks who work in these, um, in these areas. So like social workers, you know, um, case workers on social assistance and so on how they often don't believe their clients when they say that they are, you know, struggling in these ways that they can't find something or wh whatever it might be. And so they could be, you know, they could be, um, their social assistance could be stopped suddenly and they don't know why, or they, you know, have over overpayment issues and they, again, don't know why. And again, it continues that cycle where people who are already low income are being more severely punished for something that they supposedly, you know, maybe they didn't know, something because that information is confusing <laughs> and that entire system is not really equipped to um, teach people what they need to what they need to know you know it you're you're putting people who are already low income and struggling into a system where with the littlest thing they are their livelihoods could be taken away and it's at the whim of somebody else and potentially at the whim of somebody who doesn't believe them who already recognizes them, you know, in, in a less humane way, and who potentially blames them for their own issues and their own poverty. And that's that's one of the major intersections between poverty and anti-Black racism. We also hear from a lot of folks who are in ha have housing issues who are being evicted. The Wellesley Institute in Toronto uh, put out a report in August 2020 that really shows how people how black people are more at risk of evictions and, and are so at higher rates, you know, and there are higher rates of eviction in neighborhoods that are more black and low income. And so, you know, again, eviction is one of those things that could be the start of a very vicious cycle of poverty, right? Um, and there's many, plenty of examples also uh, of how um, the child welfare system as well as, uh, as well as the criminal justice system and how they, impact severely, again, Black populations disproportionately and encourage policing and surveillance of Black communities, especially low-income Black communities, and um, punish those communities and punish families, people at a young age, and start those cycles of poverty that, again, you know, extremely difficult to get out of and people can become trapped in. So those are just a few examples. Um, and at the root of these issues that we, we see and we recognize, um, you know, at Black, we have, um, we have an understanding of anti-Black racism that centers, um, that centers Black people and that recognizes how policies and practices have been in place, embedded in Canadian institutions, um, and that have, you know, continued from a legacy of enslavement and colonization and how globally 
anti-black racism has impacted people. So, you know, we're thinking new immigrants, but also uh, black people that have been on these lands for a very long time and how there are institutions in place that, that continue to do that. And we see that so severely in terms of poverty rates, um, as well as, you know, the rates in the child welfare system, rates of eviction, rates of, um, um, even now, you know, in terms of who ended up contracting the virus um, and who was more at risk of contracting the virus as well, right? Um, so those are just a few examples of where we, where we see those intersections. Um, and um, I'm happy to speak about some things more often uh, or, or a bit more in a, in a bit more detail. And, um, but I would definitely just add to that, that in terms of how to address these issues, I mean, all of these problems, these are different areas of law, these are different governmental institutions, different ministries, different things, but we really do have to approach them, recognizing how they all impact each other and how they impact certain marginalized groups more so. And we already know how they do. They did that. The data is out there. We've been analyzing this for a very, very long time. We understand systemic racism. We understand systemic anti-Black racism. We understand the ways that poverty is cyclical. We we know all of these facts. There's, you know, the reports are all out there <laughs> and they keep coming out and we recognize all of these things, but what do we do about centering the lives of those people and recognizing the humanity of those people in terms of policy making and in, in decision making? Yeah, totally. Um, when you talk about how cyclical it is, um, whereas in education, employment, justice system, accessing social assistance, housing, I think it explains so much of the indicators we were talking about, about child welfare, about housing. Uh, at Food Secure Canada, we work a lot on food insecurity, of course. And recently in the past year, we found from Food Share and Proof, a center for research, that black folks experience hunger. So food insecurity at 3.5 times compared to the regular pop, uh, the rest of the population. So mm -hmm. it's helpful to see all these, um, all of these barriers, it's big for sure. But like you said, we've been documenting this for a long time. There's a lot of good solutions moving forward. So I, I wanna get more into detail with you about that later. But next I'll switch to French and uh, introduce you to Daniel Marino. Donc, Daniel est un bénévole permanent avec ATD Carmon depuis 2013. Il était actif contre l'extrême pauvreté en Afrique avec différentes organisations, dont ATD Carmon. En ce moment, au Canada, il agit pour faire reculer l'extrême pauvreté dans son propre pays à partir d'accents ancrés au Québec. Son parcours polyvalent lui a fait passer par les chantiers de construction, la théologie et la littérature pour en venir à militer pour la dignité des personnes en situation de pauvreté. Donc, bonjour Daniel, c'est fun de rencontrer quelqu'un d'autre à, à Montréal. Puis j'aime comment tu te décris comme bénévole permanent. Euh, permanent. Je vois, euh, Connais plus sur ça. Comment est-ce que tu es arrivé dans ton rôle actuel avec ATD? Puis c'est comment travailler dans ta domaine, euh, surtout pendant une pandémie? Eh oui. Euh, ben, pour préciser, on, en français, on joue avec le mot. En anglais, vous n'avez pas cette liberté-là. Euh, en français, on dit que je suis volontaire permanent. Et on fait une petite distinction avec euh, bénévole. Bonne chance, les traducteurs, je suis désolé. Euh, mais euh, et donc euh, c'est à dire que la, 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 voilà c'est un statut un peu différent mais c'est pas uniquement euh, euh, bénévole si on pourrait dire sans, sans revenu euh, voilà euh, en fait ce qui m'a amené à, à Télécar Monde c'est que justement j'ai eu une expérience en Afrique j'ai eu euh, une part de déception euh, parce que je, je souhaitais qu'on puisse euh, travailler avec les gens. Et l'organisation avec laquelle j'étais euh, disait ça dans, ses, euh, dans cette énoncé de mission. Mais quand nous étions sur le terrain, finalement, euh, travailler avec les gens, ça voulait dire euh, les gens font ce qu'on leur dit. Euh, et on trouvait ça décevant. Donc, quand je suis revenu au Canada, j'ai cherché, je disais, ah, je cherche quelqu'un qui, qui, qui cherche à travailler avec les gens. J'ai découvert à TD Carmonde. Euh, et euh, qu'on cherche de plus, toujours de plus de donner la voix à, aux personnes en, en situation de pauvreté et de travailler avec, et d'imaginer des, des idées avec eux. Euh, ce qui fait qu'à à, Télé Carmon, à, à, en ce moment au Canada, à Montréal, on mène des actions euh, y, euh, beaucoup pour permettre aux gens en situation de pauvreté d'exprimer leur savoir et leur vécu. 
et, et de trouver une manière de, de, de leur permettre d'avoir de, de, une voix dans la société, que ce soit auprès des autorités ou auprès d'autres instances à différents endroits. Super, merci. Um, J'aime beaucoup ces deux mots ensemble, travailler avec. J'aimerais rentrer plus en détail avec ça. Um, mais maintenant, pour la question plus précise, plus précise um, la TDK Monde est un organisme international et tu travailles avec le chapitre canadien ici au Québec. Des fois, quand les gens pensent à la pauvreté, ils ont l'impression que c'est un enjeu d'ailleurs, par exemple dans un pays en voie de développement ou les économies émergentes. Pourrais-tu parler un peu plus de l'expérience des gens qui vivent dans l'extrême pauvreté ici au Québec, avec qui vous travaillez, et comment un pays aussi riche que la nôtre se trouve dans, avec autant d'inégalités ou des disparités de richesses? Oui, c'est... J'allais dire, c'est une question un peu euh, qui, qui nous fait mal euh, euh, aux Canadiens, je veux dire. Euh, il y a, en 2015, euh, ici à, à Montréal, nous a, ben, au Québec, plutôt, nous avons fait une recherche euh, sur la relation entre la, les, les soins de santé et les gens en situation de pauvreté. Et il est sur le, le, parmi les chercheurs, euh, il y avait des universitaires, mais il y avait aussi des personnes en situation de pauvreté qui étaient là à titre de, de, de co-chercheurs. Euh, et donc, on a pu produire un rapport en, en 2015 sur, euh, qui faisait état de, de, de certaines difficultés, défis pour les gens en situation de pauvreté. Euh, ce que je voulais dire, c'est qu'on a eu l'occasion de pouvoir présenter ce, ce rapport à un, à un groupe euh, à l'ONU, aux Nations Unies, à New York. Et euh, donc, on, plusieurs délégations de différents pays ont été invitées à participer puis à, à entendre notre présentation de rapport. Et à notre grande déception, l'équipe euh, du Canada, plutôt euh, la, 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 les diplomates canadiens, ont reçu le mandat de, de refuser de participer. Et à l'époque, le gouvernement canadien avait dit euh, euh, non, il n'y a pas de pauvreté où, euh, au, au Canada. Donc, on, euh, on refuse donc de participer à, à, à l'expérience. Euh, l'exposé d'une mission, d'une recherche qui parle du rapport entre la pauvreté et, euh, et euh, la, la, les systèmes de santé au, au Québec. Euh, je peux vous dire que Pierre et France euh, et Robert qui étaient là, quand ils ont appris, ils ont compris ça, et eux, c'est comme si on leur disait, vous n'existez pas. Euh, C'était pas, euh, ah, pas seulement pour eux une, une réponse politique, c'était une réponse euh, d'identité. C'est-à-dire que ce que vous avez vécu depuis tant d'années, euh, c'est une illusion, alors que, que c'est tout à fait faux. Euh, on a bien conscience à, à TD Carmonde que le repère international, souvent mentionné pour euh, euh, parler d'extrême pauvreté, qui est de dire 1,90$ par jour, quelqu'un qui gagne 1,90$ par jour euh, est donc dans, dans l'extrême pauvreté. Euh, et automatiquement, au Canada, euh, toi, est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui gagne moins que 1,90 par jour? Donc, on se dit, voilà, c'est mathématique, il n'y a pas d'extrême de, pauvreté, il n'y a pas de, de grande pauvreté. Or, à Télécarmonde, on a fait une recherche internationale avec trois pays euh, du Sud, trois pays du, du Nord. Euh, encore là, en, en co-recherche avec des, des gens en situation de pauvreté, des universitaires, des gens de terrain, pour, euh, pour repérer... Comment on dit la pauvreté euh, dans notre réalité? Donc, les, les six pays ont fait leur, leur recherche localement. Euh, le Canada, il n'était pas un de ces pays, mais il y a eu les États-Unis, euh, le Royaume-Uni, euh, la France pour les pays du Nord. Et il y avait la Tanzanie, la, la Bolivie et le Bangladesh. Après que les, les six pays ont fait leur, leur, leur rapport, ils se sont réunis ensemble et ils ont, euh, euh, ils ont fait comme un, un bilan ou un, une une synthèse internationale pour dire qu'est-ce qui se retrouve dans toutes nos, nos expériences. Et, euh, et le rapport a été euh, euh, diffusé il y a, ça fait peut-être un, un an, qu'on appelle les dimensions cachées de la pauvreté. Euh, là, là. Et on a discuté avec nos membres ici au, euh, au Québec. On a pris les, 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 les dimensions euh, dites en question. Il y en a neuf au niveau international. Euh, et euh, et finalement, les gens en situation de pauvreté ici se retrouvent pleinement dans, euh, euh, dans ces dimensions. 
je ne veux pas nécessairement toutes les, les, euh, les mentionner. Il y en a qui sont évidentes, hein, comme euh, le, le, le manque de travail décent, euh, le revenu insuff insuffisant, c'est des choses qui sont bien connues, euh, mais il y en a d'autres euh, et qu'on découvre qui sont des expériences partout euh, euh, pareilles, donc ici aussi au, au Canada, par exemple, la, la maltraitance sociale. Euh, qui, dans certains aspects, pourraient être identifiés avec le, le, les exemples de racisme qu'on a entendus, euh, mais qui ne se limitent pas à, aux gens de, de, de couleur, mais des, beaucoup de gens en situation de pauvreté vivent des expériences euh, qui se rapprochent. Euh, ben pour donner un exemple, il euh, y a l'équipe de chercheurs aux États-Unis, il y avait une personne euh, euh, une afro américaine de New York, et il y a eu un, un, quelqu'un des Premières Nations euh, du New Mexico, du Nouveau-Mexique. Et, et, et les deux, en, en, en partageant ensemble, ont découvert qu'ils avaient des... des euh, J'ai le mot anglais, pardon. Pattern, ils avaient des, des, des processus euh, man, man, mental ou de, de, de comportement euh, très similaires de, de, pour éviter justement euh, d'être pointé du doigt, d'être observé. Alors qu'ils qu euh, qu ont deux expériences euh, euh, complètement différentes dans leur même pays, euh, au, au cœur de, de, euh, de ces dimensions euh, euh, de la pauvreté qui ont été identifiées, j'aimerais quand même mentionner euh, un qui est précis, qui est la dépossession du pouvoir d'agir. Hein. Euh, juste pour aider nos, nos traducteurs, euh, le mot anglais c'était « disempowerment ». Donc, la, la, donc la, la, la dépossession du pouvoir de dire, c'est donc cette, cette expérience. Et ça, ici, vous, vous, il y a plusieurs personnes nous l'expriment, surtout si on pense à quand c'est face à, à différents soutiens qui sont offerts. Euh, les personnes en situation de pauvreté ne, ne sentent pas qu'ils ont le pouvoir de, de prendre une décision euh, selon leur goût. Tu vois, par exemple, quelqu'un qui veut trouver du travail pour sortir peut-être de l'aide sociale, euh, cette personne a, a des désirs, des, des, des aspirations, des, des, des choses, des préférences, mais souvent on va l'orienter d'une manière, d'une manière qu'on n'offrera pas à quelqu'un qui n'est pas en situation de pauvreté. On va leur dire, ah toi tu dois aller euh, là-dedans. Euh, ce sont des expériences qu'on entend aussi, même pour euh, les enfants à l'école dans certains quartiers, on les oriente euh, comme vers euh, certains, certaines voies. On dit que c'est pour les aider, que c'est plus facile. Euh, mais finalement, leur, leur pouvoir d'agir, de prendre une décision sur leur vie, on, on leur enlève. Euh, pour prendre un, un exemple, euh, un autre euh, exemple qui, qui arrive, euh, qui nous revient souvent, qu'on entend souvent, c'est l'exemple des banques alimentaires, par exemple, où il euh, on, on, y a un homme qui nous dit, surtout depuis la pandémie, il dit oh, « on ne peut plus choisir, on nous donne une boîte, je dois tout prendre, je ne dois rien laisser euh, ». Pour, pour l'anecdote, il nous a apporté ici un énorme sac de moutarde euh, industrielle, j'ai l'impression, euh, parce qu'il n'avait pas le droit de dire non. Mais il ne mange pas autant de moutarde que ça. Donc, euh, on cherche le moyen de, de, de le partager avec d'autres. Mais il a, pas eu le, il, a pas, il a perdu le, le, le choix, le pouvoir de, de, de choisir. Ouais. Donc, c'est des exemples que je peux mentionner. Oui, c'est vraiment difficile, je pense. Merci, Daniel. Je pense qu'il y a beaucoup de banques alimentaires qui essaient de... Tu sais, ils se demandent comment est-ce qu'on peut euh, aider les gens à euh, trouver d'aide avec la dignité. Puis, ils essaient de donner un choix, si possible, mais avec les pandémies, ça se bouscule tout. Il faut qu'on s'innove. Euh, euh, comment dit-on ça en, en français? Je vais faire ça en style montréalais. I'm going to do this Montreal style. We have to innovate pour trouver les bonnes solutions. Désolée aux interprètes, je viens de changer de langue dans une phrase. Mais merci, Daniel. Je vais retourner à quelques uh, thèmes que tu as soulevés, um, surtout sur les indicateurs dimensions pour mesurer les pauvretés. Maintenant, je vais retourner à Janine Harvey, qui nous joint de Northwest Territories. Um, now, I will turn to Janine Harvey, who's calling in from the Northwest Territories. Um, and uh, Janine, I think you're calling in, so you didn't, uh, you weren't able to access the simultaneous translation, but I want to let you know that um, Daniel Marino from Quebec just shared about his perspective and work with ATD Fourth World. 
um, how has um, the value of working with communities and um, how when we ignore or deny the existence of poverty, we also deny the existence of people who live these realities. So that was very powerful. Thank you, Danielle. So let me tell you a bit more about Janine. Uh, Janine is calling in today from Alukatuk, Northwest Territories. She was adopted into an Inuit family and grew up there, uh, moving away in 1999 to go to school in Yellowknife. She lived in Yellowknife for over two decades before moving back to her hometown of Alukatuk. Janine has been working since a young age to help her family, working for the YWCA and the Women's Society in Yellowknife. She has received a scholarship from the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness in recognition of her work with Housing First. She currently sits on the board of the Pan-Canadian Voice for Women's Housing, as well as Campaign 2000. Outside of work, Jeannie has five children and four stepchildren, and is a proud grandmother to six grandchildren. She is fluent in her language, and she enjoys making traditional clothing, hunting, camping, fishing, and sharing of her culture to others. And when she was sharing her biography with us, she wrote, I am a mother, wife, daughter, and a supporter for Inuit culture, an advocate and a survivor. I now dedicate my time to helping other Indigenous women flee domestic violence. I thought that was a really powerful statement. Janine, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Perfect, so glad to hear from you. So we learned a little bit about what brought you to this work in your biography. Could you, um, so I'll ask you a quick question just to help us better understand your context and then I'll go more into detail with the second question. So how does your work look like in the day to day? Um, well, I I moved to Uluqaqtuk about a year ago, so I've been working from home a lot. Um, just there isn't, uh, there isn't any kind of advocacy jobs up here in the North, in my community and there isn't, uh, there isn't a shelter, there isn't uh, the job that I've worked in the past, there isn't that opportunity in small communities, in most small communities. So a lot of the work I do is volunteer work and uh, just keeping my home open and uh, making my community aware of um, some of the social issues that we've been facing. So I've just kind of take this on on myself the last year being in Uruhaktok and uh, I, I think that's where did I answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I wish I could see you, but I know the internet access is a bit hard where you are. Let me go into more detailed questions. Yeah, we... Oh, sorry. Um, the rates of poverty, food insecurity, and housing insecurity in the North are well documented, as are unfortunately the tragic rates of suicide. Could you help us put a more human face on these statistics? Um, what is it like for people who experience poverty in the North? Um, well, first of all, I, I saw it the whole time I was working in Yellowknife. It's very visible downtown Yellowknife. The poverty rates, the uh, no housing in Yellowknife is very visible when I was working with Housing First. We had um, over 100 people on our list that are experiencing homelessness and poverty. But uh, since I've moved to the community, back to my community, there's about 450 people here, uh, which I, I see on a weekly basis, uh, poor housing, uh, because we don't have money for repairs, because there's no supplies in the community to do repairs for mold. So we have people living in molded housing um, and still paying really high cost of rent. We all know that um, in Canada, we pay one of the highest rent rates. Um, the food prices are, um, are I'm going to say um, we have a family of four. We spend about $500 a week on food. That's about $2,000 a month. That does not include uh, pampers and milk for a baby, and that does not include hygiene products. Um, so we have a lot of families that are living in um, in one unit, three, two to three families living in one home because there's just no housing. Uh, we don't have transitional housing. We don't have shelters. So that's the kind of things we experience and the kind of things that I see people struggling with is overcrowding, um, which overcrowding leads to addictions. You see a lot of addictions. Um, you see a lot of elder abuse uh, mm -hmm. that's with no support for elder abuse. You see very poor hygiene. Um, we don't, you know, we, we have a water truck and a sewage truck that comes by on Monday to Friday. And uh, we see a lot of uh, kids that don't have any food to eat because there's so many people to feed. 
Um, so I, those are some of the things I see. And then living in these conditions and living the way we live in poverty and with uh, poor housing and no support from from local governments or uh, from the government is we see a lot of suicide. We hear of suicide on a, on a weekly basis. Um, I'm going to give you, um, my husband is from Kogoloktok Nunavut and uh, from November 2019 to I believe March of this year, we've had uh, six suicides in that one community. Um, and so the things you you see too on Facebook, it's, it is a weekly where you see young people, you know, saying goodbye to family and friends through Facebook because they're going to commit suicide. Um, so we, we see that a lot. We, we, uh, the trauma from suicide affects the whole community and, uh, without the support and without, um, you know, the information or, um, you know, uh, cultural rights or, you know, things being taken away, it impacts our, impacts our way of life and just, it, we see it all the time. That's what I'm saying. We we see it. We live it. We hear it, um, and that's all. That all leads to uh, you know living in poverty, you know, living in overcrowding. Addictions plays a really has a really big impact in the high suicide rates. Thank you for sharing that, Jenny. That sounds incredibly difficult, and I think sharing that you bring up a good point that um, when you work in anti-poverty work when you work in community work, a big part of this work is actually working with a lot of grief. And I want to recognize that all the people um, on this call, many people who work in this uh, area or the panelists bring a lot of that uh, grief to their daily work, but also strength. And um, before I let you go and go into the general questions with all the panelists, Janine, tell me about coming from your background and you saw a lot of this in Yellowknife, um, the homelessness and the poverty you mentioned, and the continue um, the continued challenge of poor housing, but high rent in your community now. What is something that motivates you in your work today? What is some of the strength that you see in your community right now? Um, well, I see people um, reaching out a lot more and not being scared to um, to speak up. I see, you know, like since I've gotten here and people recognize my background and what I could bring to the table and what I could advocate for, I see a lot more, uh, a lot more women, a lot more youth um, wanting to speak out, you know, and I see a lot more, um, I see a lot of more of our, uh, our culture being brought to the table, trying to uh, revitalize our culture, uh, trying to, you know, be out more on the land, and so I've seen some of those those positive things where we're trying to, uh, you know, gain our culture back. And uh, so those are some of the things I, I see. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I think um, a common theme I see here from all the panelists is that uh, there's a sense when you live in poverty, when you live in discrimination, and that it's cyclical and systemic, that you don't have power. And it's so important, this work where you remind um, people and we remind each other of the dignity we do have inherent in each of us and the power we can take to change our own communities. On that, I'd like to ask a question to all of the panelists and I invite all of you to either mute yourself and answer it however you'd like. And um, in the next 10 minutes, uh, we can dive into this question. And if you want to, uh, let's say Janine, you want to hear more from Kada on a specific point, feel free to jump in and ask her. So here's the question. Canada has an existing legal obligation to protect people's right to an adequate standard of living. Unfortunately, we all know that this is not the lived reality for millions of people. The two on this campaign is asking the government of Canada to fulfill this legal and moral obligation and commit to ending poverty by 2030, which is consistent with the sustainable development goals. What would it look like for the people and communities that you're a part of to be able to enjoy an adequate standard of living? So kind of like a blue sky scenario. And also more specifically, what are the targets you would recommend to measure our progress towards the school? So any of the panelists go, um, feel free to go and answer that. 
Okay, I can start. Um, it's Janine from the Northwest Territories. I um, I guess what I'm going to say is uh, for for that question is uh, I'm going to speak a bit about uh, the relocation of Inuit in 1953 and 1955. Um, Inuit people all over Nunavut and NWT were relocated from the government to make sure that we can have uh, you know stake out as much land as we can in the Arctic. Um, by the when the government decided they're going to relocate us and relocate our Inuit people, we were promised better living. We did not see any. We did not see um, better living. What we saw was a loss of culture, a new way of life. We saw residential school. We saw abuse and more addictions. So I'd really like the government to uh, go back to what they had promised us and uh, go back to uh, keeping their promise. Um, I'd like to see more low-cost housing in the small communities. I'd like to see tra- transitional housing. I'd like to see shelters for for safe homes for women and children or anyone fleeing family violence. Um, I'd like to see, you know, more Inuit owning homes um, and no evictions. Uh, when we when Inuit people in small communities are evicted, we have nowhere to go. We go into homelessness. We go into a staying into a cabin where it's 50 below zero, it's minus, minus 50 most winters. And so I, in, there's got to be a solution to uh, solution to not letting people go into homelessness because we live in the extreme cold and there's no other options for us. There's only one place you can rent and that's the NWT Housing Corporation in the small communities anyways. Um, just an action from the government um, because they've known this for many years. They've known... They've known the problems, but we haven't seen any action being taken from the government, and we haven't seen we haven't seen it in the small communities. We may have seen it in the big hubs, but in the small communities, we haven't seen seen much of that. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Any of the other panelists? What would it look like for your communities to be um, that you are a part of to enjoy an adequate standard of living? And what are the targets you recommend to measure our progress? Or otherwise, uh, oui. okay, vas-y, Daniel. Très bien. Euh, un des, 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 des points, moi, je crois, qui, qui serait précieux, comme euh, on pourrait dire en, en amont, ce serait de, de, de cibler et d'attaquer des, des idées fausses euh, sur les gens qui vivent la pauvreté. On pourrait parler de, des préjugés. Euh, donc, d'une part, c'est déjà de, de, de pouvoir identifier ces, ces préjugés. Euh, afin que les gens qui prennent des décisions puissent euh, mettre en lumière, euh, avoir conscience de, 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 de la manière que leurs idées sont, sont tordues. Euh, je pourrais donner un exemple, euh, par exemple sur l'itinérance, on va souvent dire « Ah, les itinérants, ils ont choisi ce mode de vie. Euh, » C'est pas faux que certains le disent, mais souvent, ils, ils le choisissent par dépit. Toi. C'est parce qu'ils ils sont coincés là-dedans qu'ils se disent « mieux vaut le, le, après coup le, le choisir euh, ». Ils... Mais ce, qu'on, ce que je veux dire, c'est qu'il y a des idées fausses qui, qui impactent nos décisions. Euh, et certainement, je pense à des idées fausses sur euh, les conditions des, des gens au territoire du Nord-Ouest, là, comme Janine le décrit. Et si le... Si les institutions sur place là-bas n'agissent pas, c'est qu'ils sont influencés par une idée. Euh, et donc, je vais donner un exemple. C'est vrai que c'est difficile à mesurer, là, mais euh, souvent on a l'idée que si on, on donne moins d'argent aux gens, ils vont se, se sentir obligés d'aller travailler puis de se sortir de la pauvreté. Euh, or, au début 2000, ici euh, au Québec, le, le, le gouvernement du Québec avait donné plus d'argent en, aux gens à l'aide sociale euh, mais en ciblant les familles. Or, ce qu'on a repéré statistiquement, c'est que c'est dans cette période-là qu'il y a le plus de gens qui sont sortis de l'aide sociale. Donc, euh, les gens à qui on avait donné plus d'argent, euh, ça leur a permis de souffler, mais, euh, et donc ils sont sortis de la, de la pauvreté. Mais il faut, étant donné qu'il y a cette idée fausse derrière qui influence la décision, mais qui n'est pas, personne ne va écrire, euh, ah, euh, cette idée fausse dans leur, dans leur rapport de décision. Donc voilà, ça c'est, c'est, 
as une idée que, que je peux proposer. Super, merci, Daniel. In the last few minutes, Hada, did you have anything you want to add? You can also skip this question if you'd like. I could just add something. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said, Rachel. Oh, um, I said uh, you can answer the question of what would look like to have access to um, to an adequate standard of living in your community and the targets you use you would recommend to measure that progress. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think a, an adequate standard of living. I mean, um, broadly speaking, it would look like adequate housing, access to food, access to services, and so on. Um, a and more specifically, um, dismantling the barriers that make that impossible for the Black community and or for low-income um, Black people in Canada and in Ontario, um, that would look like the ability to um, not be under surveillance um, in different under different institutions. It would look like to not be in fear of punishment in these different institutions. All those examples that I brought up before. Um, and how they intersect with the, with these continued ideas of um, surveillance, punishment, lack of trustworthiness, and so on, um, and how it leads to into further cycles. Um, it would look like a lack of criminalization and a way to address the roots of that criminalization, and recognize the roots of the of those um, you know oppressive forces and um, and you know some of the st uh, statistics that I shared earlier also provide that story and they also provide, I guess, measures, the targets, or rather, they provide the measures that we're using to, um, to measure the, the issue of poverty and systemic oppression and so on. And so similarly, those targets, I think, um, are, can be effective to measure uh, what an adequate standard of living can look like. Um, and, you know, um, both Janine and Danielle have brought up such great points. Um, and specifically to what Daniel was mentioning also about social assistance and those um, um, and the amount of money that is given to families. We saw over the past few months that the federal government recognized that at least $2,000 per person is necessary, um, you know, to live, which is much higher than, uh, than the rates of social assistance, much, much higher <laughs> than the rates of social assistance. And so people who have been living in poverty are expected to live in to continue to live in extreme poverty. And while people who have been recognized to, you know, have lost their jobs, oh, you, you need at least $2,000 a month to survive. And, you know, we could go into, obviously there's many other issues with CERB and, and so on, but like that is at least a recognition of the fact that the, the level of assistance that is given to people to, put, to not continue to live in poverty is recognized as completely inadequate and that people are pushed into living in continued inadequacy and continued poverty, and it is extremely legal <laughs> and supported. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think those are sorts of the things we, we would need to think about. Thanks, Halda. Um, uh, those are great targets that you guys have identified, um, homelessness rate, housing and quality of housing, criminalization. Uh, what I find encouraging, what all of you are saying, we combine all of those visions together from Janine, Daniel, and Hada, is that um, with communities, we're able to have an adequate standard of living. It's communities where youth see opportunity. Families have clean places to live where we can feed our families in dignity and get help when we need it. And um, let's keep that in mind. And we'll get back into more uh, general questions with all the panelists. But Natalie, can you let me know if there are any questions from any of our elected officials, MPs, or senators joining us right now? Yes, I'd like to welcome any MPs or senators who are with us to either share in the chat if they would like to ask a question. I do have one to get us started. Um, this is from MP Larry Bagnell, who is an MP from Yukon, and he asks, as one of the organizers and members of the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition, I know there are many things we need to do, but what is one item from each panelist that is either the highest priority or the first thing that we should do in Canada to reduce poverty? Um, to reduce poverty, it's Janine from Northwest Territories. I think uh, 
one uh, to reduce poverty in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, I would uh, think that school lunches for all uh, kids and youth that attend school would be a good start just because we have, uh, we pay a lot of money for food. Like, um, I'm going to give you an example, $72 for asparagus, um, you know, a fruit tray, $75 for a fruit tray, which we pay $20 in Yellowknife. Um, so I'm going to, I want to advocate and I want to let the government know and I want to let, um, you know, people who advocate for for anti-poverty is I think we need to um, relay to the government that school lunches, you know, we never know what's happening behind closed doors at home or if people have food or not. Most people, Inuit people are very proud. They, they don't want to tell people, you know, maybe I don't have food. So if we provide free lunches for all kids that go to school, I think that would be a really good start for NWT and Nunavut is uh, having free lunches to reduce poverty in, in youth. Thank you. And lowering the cost of food prices, sorry. Hello? Would you guys like to add to that? Hada or Danielle? Uh, oui. Uh, je veux bien uh, ajouter un, un, un truc, je crois, qui, qui peut vraiment aider à, à pour réduire la pauvreté. C'est En fait, ce serait d'intégrer l'influence de personnes qui vivent eux-mêmes la pauvreté dans le processus de décision. Uh, Je sais que je ne vous offre pas une solution pointue qui, qui résout directement un point, mais les gens qui vivent la, la pauvreté ont, ont, ont eux-mêmes un, un savoir et une expérience. Et, et ça serait un, c'est une recommandation que, que je dirais, qui aiderait définitivement à, à changer les, les processus de décision et combattre la pauvreté. Merci, Daniel. Halda, without having to get into specific uh, policy recommendations, are there certain ideas or um, in your legal work, for example, are there laws that um, would be helpful or need to be changed? Are, are there some barriers that you would see as sort of a first step to tackling? Um, I think a lot of the time when we uh, when we think about policy reform, we're also working a lot in reaction to things that are happening, especially out here in Ontario right now. Um, and so from our perspective, one thing I could bring up is um, um, legal aid and um, the way that legal aid is necessary for people who are low income um, to be able to address legal situations that could um, plummet into extreme, you know, more extreme situations, more extreme issues. Um, and how there needs to be continued support for that. Thanks everyone. Um, I'm going to turn things over for our next question to MP Jenny Kwan. I invite you to ask your question now. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Well, first off, thank you so much uh, to all the panelists uh, for your comments. Uh, I learned a lot actually listening to everybody today. Uh, about what's going on across the country. So my, um, I have two questions. In fact, uh, as it was mentioned that safe, secure, affordable housing is intrinsically tied to poverty. And while the Liberal government declared that adequate housing is a basic human right, uh, we have not seen that become reality. Uh, and, uh, and so to that end, in the throne speech, uh, the government declared that they would uh, end chronic homelessness but with no plan, no timeline, the national housing strategy is not delivering the housing that we desperately need. And so um, the only concrete element that was put forward uh, was an announcement made before the throne speech, and that is providing a, um, a rapid housing initiative of 3,000 units of housing for across the country. So I'd just like to ask the panelists what their thoughts are 
about our national housing strategy to date? Is it delivering the housing that you need? And if not, what do you want to see from the government? What are the targets? What are the goals to end homelessness across the country? Second to this question uh, is the issue tie right to poverty. And it was mentioned about the misconceptions of, of people who are poor, people who are on income assistance and how people judge and, and even governments, how they judge people uh, who are um, living in poverty. And to that end, what is the solution to end poverty? And my colleague uh, MP Leah Gazan has put forward a motion uh, to call for basically uh, a um, adequate income, if you will, a, uh, a basic income for all. And so I'd love to hear from the panelists what they thought about that solution to end poverty. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Kwan. Um, I will invite our panelists if you'd like to start maybe with the question regarding housing. Um, and then after everyone who would like to has shared, we can um, flip to the question of a, of a guaranteed basic income. So would anyone like to get us started? Hey, um Thanks for the question. Um, I mean, recognizing housing as a human right um, requires a lot of policy changes afterwards to ensure that um, uh, that people's um, right to adequate housing, um, their human right that should be now enshrined in law, um, is uh, you know that policies are formed around that, and that that. Uh, that that human right is centered and um, it also is necessary given the way that our all of our governments are structured for different levels of government to work together to ensure that right um, so the fact I mean speaking I'm right here in Toronto obviously so thinking of the way that the city of Toronto Ontario and Canada all need to work cohesively in order to ensure that Human, the human rights of people are centered in that decision-making process, that that is prioritized in policy over, um, um, that that is prioritized over um, like the financial benefits of uh, the current real estate markets and, and so on. And uh, that that is, that that's the number, I mean, I think we, we should constantly be prioritizing everybody's human rights over everything else. Um, so yeah. Um, I guess I, I could start um, by saying in the small community, I think um, having shelters in small communities is really important. Um, safe elders homes, we've been advocating for that for years in small communities, is that we need elders homes that are safe with uh, home care workers that are Inuit, that are fluent in our language. Um, we need to find ways to um, increase training without having to travel out of our communities so that we can be, um, time and time again, we see people from the South that are coming up to do jobs that we are well capable of doing ourselves. But uh, as the government says, we need certain training, you know, to travel six weeks out of our community, to leave our families, to leave our cultural ways of life. It's just become very overbearing for most people. So everybody just wants to, you know, they, they don't want to leave their community, so we don't have another choice but to stay on income support. So more training for small communities, that would lead to more jobs. Um, transitional housing while you're waiting for permanent housing should be available to people in small communities. <clears throat> and uh, to look at the income support scale in the Northwest Territories and small communities, because of the price we pay for food, I don't believe uh, that we should be getting the same as somebody who lives in Yellowknife because you know they have uh, they have a lower cost of food, so I think people that are living in small communities should have a higher higher um, supplement from the government to uh, help pay for food. And uh, <clears throat> um, another thing I speak about culture before is um, putting more money into small um, organizations and communities like community corporations for people to take advantage of uh, going hunting for our own uh, our own food, to go hunting caribou or muskox, to put food on the table and to sustain our culture. I think those would be um, 
some areas the government should uh, take take into consideration. Thank you. Uh, je peux ajouter rapidement euh, sur le logement. Je ne connais pas, euh, je ne suis pas à jour là, sur les, les, les mesures que instaure le, le discours du trône, peut-être. Euh, mais euh, euh, effectivement, c'est un énorme morceau euh, dans, quand on pense aux, aux revenus euh, et aux dépenses euh, des personnes en, en situation de pauvreté. Euh, c'est une euh, dépense pour tout le monde, j'en doute pas, mais pour ceux qui ont déjà, un, euh, je pense, à un, à un homme qui, qui a un, son loyer est 90 de, de, de son aide, de ce qu'il gagne à l'aide sociale. Donc, c'est de pouvoir le déclarer comme un droit, surtout dans notre pays où on ne peut pas se dire, oh, je vais dormir dans une tente euh, sans électricité. C'est un droit humain, effectivement. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, Ms. Kwan also asked if anyone would like to share any thoughts on the proposal of a guaranteed basic income. I think if you're going to do a basic guaranteed income, you do still have to look at small communities and the price of uh, rent we pay and the food prices we pay. So ours should be a lot different from um, from um, the hubs of the cities and things like that. So small communities, I believe, should have more money and our basic income should be looked at differently from the rest of Canada just because of the, the high food prices and the high rent we pay. Can I jump in here to say that at Food Security Canada, following the throne speech, we also recognize three key opportunities, uh, one of which is to establish a universal livable income floor beneath which no one can fall, including uh, a similar concept as what Janine mentioned, that it uh, should be a, according to communities too. Thank you to our panelists and, uh, and Rachel, and uh, thank you to MP Kwan. Um, I don't believe there are other questions from any other members of parliament or senators who are with us today. Um, so I will move to some questions from other attendees. Uh, so we have one question, first of all, for Janine. Uh, Sandra wanted to ask Janine, how has COVID impacted the situation in your community, Janine? Um, well, I, I'm going to start this off on a, on a positive note. I'm going to say that uh, we, um, uh, we've really gained in our cultural ways of living. We've, uh, we've gained a lot in um, being out on the land more. Um, going out to our cabins with our family, and uh, I hear a lot of people being more, you know, more more close with their family, more cultural at home, more cultural activities at home. Um, hygiene has become a re is uh, become a real uh, big concern within the community, um, so that's a really good thing. You know, every everybody's learning about, uh, you know, hand washing and things like that. That that you never really heard about before. So um, I think Facebook is really fluttered with lots of uh, lots of cultural activities happening right now for, for our um, our region. And uh, I sit with the Inevaluate Regional Corporation. They've been very uh, helpful in giving money for us to go out on the land. So we saw that a lot. They were, they were giving additional money for food and uh, gas to get out on the land. So that was really helpful. Um, a lot of money for sewing material so that uh, we can stay home and sew. And uh, that was another way of making income or sewing for your family to go out on the land. Um, the negative parts of COVID is um, it's put a lot of fear into the community of, um, of if it came here, um, because I, I believe it would wipe out more than, more than half our town or, you know, everybody. We don't have um, proper medical care up here. You know, we don't have isolation centers here. 
We don't have the equipment if anybody were to get COVID-19. Uh, we don't, we're not equipped for it in small communities. So um, that, that's the fear right now is that everybody, everybody's having it. Uh, everybody's having that fear. Um, we didn't see much flexibility in um, being lenient with our rent payments because I, I, I had wished that the government just said, you know, in small communities, we're not, we're going to give you six months free rent because a lot of money went into going out on the land. Like I said, a lot of money went into, you know, most families have three or four children. Instead of paying rent, they're paying for food. So a lot of people are having arrears right now and are um, getting letters, maybe of eviction or, you know, those kind of things. So a lot of people are scared they're going to lose their unit. And if you lose your unit, you got no choice but to re- relocate or live in a cabin. So those are some of the things we're facing. Facing right now is uh, eviction from COVID, like the after 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 COVID is uh, everybody's rent is not really paid. Um, I, I think those are the main two main main things right now that are that I could bring up. Thanks, Jenny. Euh, je vais poser la prochaine question en français. Euh, c'est une question de Francine pour Kara Hada. À propos de la surreprésentation des enfants noirs dans les services d'aide à l'enfance à Toronto, savez-vous si le nombre d'intervenants sociaux noirs est proportionnel à la population noire dans la communauté? Ne croyez-vous pas que si l'évaluation d'un, sign- d'un signalement est faite par un intervenant social de la même communauté culturelle que l'enfant, il y aurait moins de biais, de biais racial. Okay, um, I don't know the numbers. Um, maybe somebody does, but I, I don't know what they are. Um, I think that the issue of anti-Black racism and or rather generally speaking systemic racism in the child welfare system in Canada is a lot more deep-rooted than the individual social workers who are responsible for those tasks. Um, I think it's, a, it, it, I mean, it's, it certainly is an institution that was, has been used and put in place um, in a way that you know, takes families, for, uh, takes children away from families or perpetuates certain ideas and Con, you know, continues a system of um, systemic racism and um, um, of these children and of those families. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that there's um, certainly been reports and, and work done into looking at, or like, not necessarily reports, but I know that there has been also work looking in, into the way that, for example, like white social workers um, interpret certain situations with black children for example but i do think that regardless though like in place i mean it's a it's an entire institution whether the person is um what what the race of that person is they are still they're pushing forward policy and actions and so we have to question the system structurally and what it does um rather than those specific individual social workers i mean it's similarly with the police Right? There are also Black police officers, but pl- Black people are also disproportionately impacted by police violence. Um, so similarly to those kinds of questions, um, perhaps there are individuals who really want to help and who want to do their best to protect children and um, who are in situations where they you know, could be more culturally understanding or however you want to phrase it. Um, but regardless, I, at an institutional level, um, it's a question of systemic racism. Thank you, Khada. Uh, I don't see any further questions from any of our attendees. Uh, oh, maybe one more. Oh, one more, one last one. Uh, so Joe would like to know, uh, there are many, many areas where more social investment is needed if we hope to address poverty. Where do panelists advocate finding more government resources? A wealth tax, GST increase with GST rebates for low-income folks, 
ending subsidies for fossil fuel companies, other sources. So who would like to take a stab at that one? Um, I think for the Northwest Territories, uh, the food prices come from um, the airlines. So uh, airlines need to maybe, or the government needs to supplement airlines for the freight cost of the food coming in. So we pay for we pay for the food on top of it. But we also pay for the freight for the food to arrive to the community. Our community is not driving; everything flies in. So we, as a customer, have to pay for the food, have to pay for the freight of the food prices coming in on top of the food. Um, um, transportation for us to, um, you know, to to leave the community if we wanted to, like we're very isolated. It would cost me about. Three thousand dollars to go from here to Yellowknife. So transportation um, prices with airlines, uh, maybe the government working with the airlines, um, you know, for transportation and food. Thanks, Jenny. Equal with the rest of Canada, and maybe our internet. Our internet, we run on a three G internet in the Northwest Territories, and that's why I can't go on Skype. <laughs> But uh, those are some of the things that we could we could work on for. Thanks. Thank you, Janine. Would anyone else like to add anything about where we might choose to invest, Daniel? Oui, pour euh, savoir où trouver l'argent, euh, moi j'aimerais. Je, je lancerai le, la proposition d'inspecter tous les crédits d'impôt qui sont offerts, euh, peut-être pour les évaluer. Euh, je pense en fait, au, il y a souvent cette idée du, du ruissellement de la richesse vers le bas. Donc, il y a beaucoup de crédits d'impôt et on espère que les gens qui ont beaucoup d'argent vont produire de la richesse qui va ruisseler vers le bas. Euh, or, c'est... Souvent, on a vu que des grandes entreprises euh, engrangent et, et font plutôt ruisseler ça vers les actionnaires. Euh, et donc, je ne dis pas que, que les grandes entreprises ou les autres sont, sont méchants, mais plutôt, voyons quel crédit d'impôt, en fait, est offert aux, aux plus riches et qui pourrait aux plus riches euh, et qui pourrait être, finalement, cet argent pourrait être récupéré pour offrir euh, aux programmes qui aident vraiment à combattre euh, et à aider directement les gens en situation de pauvreté. Merci, Daniel. Are there any further questions? We are coming close to the end of our time. So I do, uh, I do want to tell you a little bit about um, some of the recommendations that Dignity for All is proposing based on consultations with folks with lived experience of poverty, other groups who are experiencing systemic oppression in Canada about what they believe could make a meaningful change. Um, but before then, I would just like to invite all of the panelists, if you have um, in about you know, a minute, uh, one to two minutes, any closing comments that you would like to leave with us before, before we show folks the campaign. I can start. Um, I think uh, my, my closing comments, I really, really appreciate this conversation so much. Uh, Janine and Daniel, thank you so much for uh, the perspectives you offered. Um, I think the thing we keep hearing over and over is prioritizing the needs and the services that people require to live and not just live and survive, but also thrive and live meaningful, good lives. Um, prioritizing what those are, I think, um, collectively, people have identified those services and those resources. People have identified what, where a lot of these issues are, where they lie, and the severe impact that they could have, especially when compounded with other forms of systemic oppression. And um, those things certainly can be prioritized, and those things certainly can be addressed. Um, and those are my leaving remarks, and, and just centering the lives of people and their dignity. Um, I guess I, I'm going to say um, holding the government accountable, uh, holding the government accountable for um, 
for everything they've known for years and years and years. Like I said, they, they've known everything. They've known the issues. They've known the problems. And now I think it's time for the government to take action on poverty, on um, the struggles we face in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. I think uh, the high suicide rate should be very much at the top of the list of the government to to find ways to uh, support Inuit people. I think we need organizations to start advocating more for Inuit people. We need more Inuit people at the table. Speaking of the social issues that I'm bringing up right now, time and time again, we hear excuses of why Inuit people are not at the table. And it's the same thing, the cost of the flight. You know, the cost of us to get to the table in Ottawa costs so much more than anyone else around to start hearing our issues and our problems. But yet we hear those excuses. We don't have the money to send you to Ottawa to go and talk about your issues that you're facing in the small community. So I think that really needs to be um, addressed. I think that we need um, lived experience, peer support workers, um, cultural support workers, working with social workers, working with RCMP, working with income support. Uh, we need to be able to um, have our own people working in our own communities. We need to be able to uh, start having our cultural um, rights and our cultural language being spoken more and uh, just being taken seriously by the government. Um, so I, I think, you know, those are some of the issues. Uh, the suicide, like I said, it, it's, it all ties together with the overcrowding addictions, elder abuse, poor hygiene, no food in the home. One of the youth that had uh, committed suicide in Kogoloktok, his last words to his parents were, he's tired of starving. These need to be taken very seriously. And I, I believe Inuit people are very tired of, of being on the back burner and not being, not being taken seriously. So I think we need to start having us more at the table and we need to start rallying for, for, um, for the Inuit Northern people. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Euh, moi, de mon côté, pour conclure, je dirais euh, notre pays est très vaste. Je trouve ça euh, fascinant de voir euh, euh, qu'il y a beaucoup de diversité euh, d'idées, d'initiatives et qu'on a beaucoup à apprendre les uns des autres. Euh, qu'on doit. Euh, J'espère que. En fait, il y a un monsieur qui m'a écrit euh, d'une réalité au Yukon. Et je me suis dit, ah, je dois prendre contact avec ce, ce monsieur pour connaître la. Et comment ça se vit bien ou comment ça se vit par là-bas. Euh, en dernier mot aussi, je me dis, si on, on, l'État, le gouvernement pouvait réfléchir à partir euh, des plus petits, je me dis par exemple, si on réfléchissait le logement, non pas à partir de, de Vancouver, Toronto, Montréal, mais à partir des communautés éloignées, eh bien, il se ferait un impact euh, nécessairement positif aussi pour euh, les grandes villes plutôt que de faire un programme dans les, les, les grands centres qui ne s'applique pas aux grandes villes, aux petites, petites communautés. Donc, euh, c'est ce qui, c'est ça. Réfléchissons à partir de, de, de ceux qui sont le plus euh, euh, isolés et euh, le plus vulnérables. Merci, Daniel. Well, I'd like to thank again all our panelists and Rachel, our moderator. I'd like to thank our interpreters. And I would just like to um, finish off quickly. I know we're at 2.30, but if you will indulge me uh, a couple extra minutes, um, having heard these experiences, having heard the barriers that people are facing across the country and, and particularly specific groups of people who are disproportionately feeling the impact of systemic oppression and of poverty. I'd like to share with you the asks of our Chew on This campaign for this year and invite you to make sure that your Member of Parliament knows that these are issues that you care about and that these are issues that you expect immediate and ambitious action on. So I'm going to briefly share my screen and um, show you a little bit around the campaign. Alors, je vais commencer avec nos demandes en français. Et uh, j'aimerais je, je, partager nos trois demandes. 
Nous demandons au gouvernement du Canada de remplir l'obligation légale de protéger le droit de toute personne à un niveau de vie suffisant et mettre un terme à la pauvreté au Canada d'ici 2030. Pardon. Nous demandons que le gouvernement établisse des objectifs précis pour mettre fin à la pauvreté et améliorer les mesures de bien-être et d'équité parmi des communautés en proie à une oppression systémique. Nous demandons aussi que, que ces, euh, ces objectifs seront décidés en collaboration, en consultation avec ces communautés urbaines. La troisième demande, c'est de prioriser le financement des stratégies axées sur la réduction de la pauvreté et l'amélioration des mesures de bien-être et d'équité chez les communautés en proie à une oppression systémique. Alors, nous savons par exemple que nous avons, euh, nous avons des questions de priorité avec nous. Alors, comme nous avons entendu aujourd'hui, il faut prioriser le bien-être et les droits de l'homme de toute personne, euh, incluant les, les droits des peuples indigènes. Alors, nous demandons que nous, euh, nous, nous priorisons les programmes qui vont réduire les, euh, les différences entre les personnes en pauvreté et les personnes euh, avec tout ce qu'ils ont besoin. I'm going to switch to English now. So I'd like to share a little bit about how you can take action. Uh, you can read more detail about our asks um, with, uh, with a greater clarity than I will muster right now. But very quickly, what I would love for each person on this webinar to do today and to share with all your networks is this really quick tool to send a letter to your MP. If you click on the link, it takes you to another page. There's a form that magically, when you put in your postal code, it will tell you who your MP is and it will send a letter. You can edit the letter if you choose. Uh, so you can see the letter here. You can change it if you would like to personalize it. Also, you have the option of downloading and printing physical copies of the letter. The letter is available in English, French, and in Nuktitut currently. So if you would like to print the letter and either distribute it to others who don't have access to internet or digital technology, uh, it is free to mail a letter to the House of Commons. So there's no postage required. So you can either send it that way, you can collect signatures, um, or you can send it using our online tool. So uh, we also have had a number of webinars throughout this week that you can find on the website. Again, it's chewonthis.ca or morsa.ca. You can find recordings of the webinars next week if you missed them this week. Uh, also a recording of this e-rally will be available as well. Um, so I would love for each of you to take that action and to share it with your networks. We know that there are millions of people in this country who care, and we need to make sure that our government knows just how many of us there are and that we demand action. So I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you again to our panelists. Merci à nos panelistes. Merci à notre moderatrice, Rachel, à nos interprètes, and to each of you for being with us today. I will leave this on and I will um, drop my email in the chat if you would like to follow up. And um, with that, I'll just invite our panelists, our moderators, if you'd like to unmute yourselves to say goodbye, please feel free. And once again, thank you for being with us today. It was a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, Janine. Merci beaucoup. Je souhaite euh, euh, bonne journée euh, à tous et euh, bonne euh, euh, journée euh, internationale pour l'élimination de la pauvreté à tous. <rire>